you know, one of the things I deeply miss, I was telling Laura this, and I, I'm usually not, I'm not the singing type usually, unless if I'm alone, uh, mowing the lawn or in the shower or something like that. But I was, I was telling her yesterday, I just really miss singing together. And um, uh, so I'm looking forward, whether we are in a parking lot, in our cars, or somewhere else, I'm just really looking forward to uh, singing as one of those unique forms of worship that, um, that the Lord allows us to have uh, together. But, um, you know, one of the things uh, that, that is just really obvious right now is God is softening the hearts of people. There's a great sensitivity to the things of God right now. And I'm not sure that uh, even those who are non-believers see this or realize this, uh, but things like hospitality. Uh, it's been fun as, as we've done family bike rides or walks every day. Uh, uh, and we, we were doing this before COVID and we continue to do this, but we are seeing so many front doors open and people sitting in lawn chairs, people are friendly, uh, uh, people just just wanting to chat. And um, uh, so that's a move of the Spirit. That uh, And let me encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities. Again, God is at work in some unique and powerful ways right now. And He uses this um, uh, in very strategic ways for His glory and for His name. Well, we are finishing up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So, great book, Paul's first letter to the Thessal Thessal uh, uh, Thessalonian church. And um, um, so if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 5. And, and let me just pray again. I know that we just prayed. Uh, let me just pray again as we open up the Word of God together. Holy Spirit, we know that you have put these dynamic words, divine words, together. And uh, as I look back months ago when we planned out to um, teach on First Thessalonians, we had no idea that we would be in this season right now. And yet the words that you give us through this book are so divine and timely. And again, it, it reminds us, Lord, of your sovereignty over us, that you take all of these things and you shape them and mold them, you place them in such a way for times like these. So Lord, we, we can trust that the word that you have for us this morning, that the scripture you have for us this morning is exactly what we need. In your precious and holy name, amen. Well, as you know, um, you know some of the, the uh, um, orders that we've been given by the county, they, they talk about things in terms of uh, essentials. And so if you were to read those orders or if you've seen them online, they talk about essential activities, essential businesses, essential travel, and they kind of define what all of those essentials are. And uh, it's not unlike what Paul was doing in 1 Thessalonians, is he's talking about some of the essentials of the church, the essentials of the Christian life, the essentials of how we view future. And um, as we look at this last chapter in 1 Thessalonians, this is really talking about, you know, the essential, I mean, these are the essential words of Paul to the Thessalonians. And so, um, I'm just going to kind of read through three different sections kind of in chapter 5. And uh, the beginning of chapter 5, Paul is just finishing up kind of his thoughts on what the end of chapter 4, what, we, what I preached on last week, the end of chapter 4 talked about. And then he gives some very practical uh, instructions for the church. Uh, and then he also gives us some very practical instructions for us personally. And so let me start those first uh, 11 verses of 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 
While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, let me just pause real quick. I mean, just think about this picture for a moment that Paul is painting for us. So, uh, you know, a few verses earlier at the end of chapter 4, I mean, Paul's talking about the coming of the Lord. And he's not talking so much, he doesn't focus on the when of the coming of the Lord, which so many of us are so interested in when it's going to happen. We, you know, we're looking for blood red moons and all, and, and, uh, this and that. And, and the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time on that. Paul didn't spend a lot of time on that. But he does talk about the how. And um, and he talks about the how again right here. And he, he's saying when Jesus comes, he's going to be coming like a thief in the night. I mean, he's going to come. We will have no idea when this takes place. And it's just a reminder for me that... Uh, we're not in control here. We're not in control. And I, I know there's just a massive struggle right now with the fact that we're having to be quarantined, the fact that um, some of us can't go to work, we can't function in the same ways that we have been. Some of that control that we've been feeling and hanging on to, or at least the perception of that, uh, Paul's reminding us that's not ours anyways. Like, when, when, when Jesus comes, and everything Jesus does, He is sovereignly in control of. And even the day of the Lord, He is sovereignly in control of that. And it's just a good reminder for us that even with the unknown future in front of us, we can trust a known God. We can always trust an unknown future to a known God. Well, look at verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Again, he's, he's referring back to what he said in, in chapter 4, verse 13, when he says that, that those of us that grieve as others do, uh, it's not as if we don't have hope. He's reminding us that we're children of the light, that, that uh, this ought not to surprise us. We're children of the light, children of the day, but we're not of the night or of the darkness, so don't sleep. It's just stay awake for this. And I just love the encouragement that he gives uh, to us to live in light of this. Look at verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Listen, um, not only is he saying, uh, be, uh, you know, stay awake, be sober, in the sense of be aware of what God is doing. Again, we don't have to live for uh, the ways of, of old. We don't have to live for the acceptance of people. This is a new life, a new day, a new start. And it's a great reminder that Jesus is always providing that new start. He provides that new start. So we can, you know, we can live like there's no tomorrow. We can, we can rest assured that our sovereign God, who will come like a thief in the night, wants us to live life beautifully in the freedom that the death and resurrection give us today. We're children of the light. We're children of the day. And... I think it's, it's critical for us to recognize that, you know, how, how we view the world uh, or, or our view of how the world will end will affect how we live today. Not, not, not when it will end, but how we, you know, your view on how the world will end will affect how you live today. So we walk in the newness of the day, not the past. And, and then, as we just read in verse 8, Paul says that he even gives us this new outfit to wear. He says he gives us a breastplate of faith and love, uh, a helmet uh, for the hope of salvation. And, you know, essentially, you know, he says that because we belong to the day, we put on this breastplate and helmet. Like, this is new clothing for us 
who live in the newness of Christ. And, and essentially, you, you know, you could say if, if you want to live as a child of the day, if you want to live as a child in the light, then essentially what he's saying is lead your heart by expressing faith and love. See, when we put on that breastplate of faith and love, he's essentially saying lead your heart in faith and love. You want to... Uh, you want to experience what it looks like to walk in the newness of life, to, to be that uh, child of light, child of the day, then you walk with faith and love. You express that in your daily living. He, he goes on in terms of that helmet. It's the hope of salvation. You lead your head. You lead your mind in the hope of salvation. You know, we talked about this a little bit last week. When we, we, we talked about going back to the Word of God to shape our hope. What have the promises of God said that shape our hope? And here he, he again reminds us we're putting on that breastplate of faith and love, that helmet of the hope of salvation. Now listen, I, I, I know that even before this virus, even before this quarantine, there were some things that... Um, that you were either stuck in or frustrated by. And, and that could have been something in your marriage. It could have been uh, maybe some relationships, some financial concerns, some maybe it was addictions. Maybe it was uh, pornography or substance abuse or, or maybe overeating. Maybe it was just depression or not just depression. Maybe it was depression or, or just hating your season of life. I mean, the reality is, is, is we all had some things going on before the quarantine, but now with this quarantine in place, it's perhaps even created a greater weight on you with those things that were already kind of pressing on you. And now this quarantine, maybe you just feel like you're stuck. And, and maybe even more now you feel, uh, uh, more disabled in some of those things now than you did before. You know, maybe parenting is just a greater challenge than, uh, than, than you've ever experienced. I mean, uh, if you're like us, we're ready to pay teachers like three times what they normally get, right? Maybe you're just playing that what-if game constantly in the future, about finances or family or relationships or we you know how's life going to be uh different and and that is just um creating all of these insecurities in your heart in your life i don't know where you are in that but what i know based on what what scripture is teaching us at the very front part of first thessalonians chapter five is that jesus provides a new start and he doesn't qualify when that start takes place. He just says that he always creates a new start. That's, that's the beauty of the death and resurrection is that he allows us to walk in the newness of life when we choose to allow him to be the sovereign God that he already is. When we choose to release those perceptions of control that, that we think that we, we have and allow him to be the king that he already is. And Paul is just reminding us that when we walk with that breastplate of faith and love, with that helmet of the hope of salvation, that we can experience the ultimate joy that He and only He, Jesus, brings. Well, he goes on in verse 9. He says, For God has not destined us for wrath. I mean, can we camp there for a second? Because if you were experiencing or feeling any of the things that I just said, Man, Paul clearly is reminding us, man, that is not the intent of Jesus. He hasn't allowed these circumstances right now to shape us for wrath. Rather, he is allowing these circumstances right now to shape us for his glory. That he's, he's put us in this situation for our sanctification, for our growth, for our holiness, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. So it says that He hasn't destined us for wrath, but to, ob to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Again, Jesus provides a new start. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. 
man, what a, what a great reminder of how he has purpose for us. You know, what, what if we embraced these changes differently? What if, we, what if we embraced these changes instead of protested them? What if we recognize that, that because God is sovereign, He's u- using these changes, these experiences, these circumstances to shape us for His glory and for His good? See, when we approach change in light of how God is shaping us redemptively in it, that's when we begin to find freedom. That's when we begin to find ultimate security. And if you were with us on the front end of the live stream, you, you heard that, um, that verse that, that Ed shared, Isaiah 43, 19. And, and let me reread it again because it's just a great reminder uh, and a very definitive reminder of this promise that we have from God for our good. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? It's a rhetorical question. God's saying, I'm sovereign, so do you see what I'm doing in the midst of this? And when, when this was being written uh, to uh, the, the Hebrew people, to the Israelites, they were under occupation too. They were in a shut-in in many ways like us, actually significantly worse than us. He says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is purposeful. He's purposeful right now in what's going on. Well, let's look at, uh, let's look at verses 12 through 22 for a second. Now, again, Paul, that first part of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he, he was uh, just finalizing some of his thoughts on the coming of the Lord in the day of the Lord and uh, reminding us to live for now. Live in that new start that Jesus gives us. And here's though now where he gives some practical implications for the church and for us personally. Look at verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So there's a whole bunch of commands that we have here, a whole bunch of uh, uh, application points that that Paul's giving us at the very end of this letter to the Thessalonians. It's kind of a a, a summary, it's a wrap-up for what he said at uh, those first four chapters. And essentially, he, he, he's saying to the church, be the church. Be the church. Function and operate like God created you to function and operate. And he starts off, and this is really timely for us. He says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. You know, one of the first things that we see, and again, the Thessalonian church, they were experiencing some similar things. There wasn't, uh, as best we know, there wasn't a virus going around uh, then, but they were under Roman occupation. There was persecution taking place. Uh, They weren't able to gather in a big setting and worship together and sing out loud. They couldn't even do drive-in worship together. And Paul's saying, regardless of this, He's saying, you know, respect those who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And and based on context and what we see throughout the rest of the scripture, God puts authorities in our life. He puts spiritual authorities in our life. He puts practical moral authorities in our life. There, you know, there are governments. And he, he doesn't want us ever to do something that is contrary to scripture. But he always encourages us to respect those 
even esteem, he says, those. In fact, if we're unable to respect and esteem those who are in uh, spiritual, moral, governmental uh, authority over us, then really that's an issue of pride. And Paul's saying this is something that uh, is a value not just to the community, but it's a value for the church. I mean, you've heard us, you've heard me and others talk about how we are joyfully complying with the restrictions of Tarrant County in our city. And now it makes it a lot easier for us to joyfully comply when we have good leadership in our city, in our county. But it is important for us to realize that we need to joyfully comply when we can trust that they are making choices for us in the, the be, or in the good of the community. Again, remember that God has sovereignly, sovereignly, that means like nothing takes him by surprise. He has placed people in your life, practically, morally, and spiritually, to speak into your life in such a way that it sanctifies you, it protects you, it's for your good. Well, Paul quickly follows that up by saying, after he says, and to esteem them very highly and love because of the work, be at peace among yourselves. You know, here's a call for reconciliation. I just, here's what I'm going to do with this. I'm just going to kind of walk through all of these different practical commands that he gives. I'm going to let, I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit does what he needs to do in your life as you hear these things. Um, They're all important to us. Some may be really specific to you and me today. But he says, be at peace among yourselves. Be reconciled is essentially what Paul is saying. Make sure that you have reconciled relationships among you. That doesn't mean that uh, every relationship that you have has a high degree of trust. But it means that uh, you have sought out to be one with them, whether or not they've chosen to be that with you or not, that you have done your due diligence to be at peace with them. He goes on and he says in verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle and encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. Admonish the idle. Hey, this is a reminder for us as a church. We respect our authorities, but we cannot be idle. The church is to always be advancing. It's always to be moving. The church was never intended to be stationary. You cannot quarantine the gospel. You cannot quarantine uh, God's church. It it doesn't matter. We can quarantine ourselves, but that is not acting as the church. We act with wisdom and thoughtfulness, but we respond as the church redemptively, particularly in times like this. And Paul's saying, listen, if your feet are just stuck on the ground, if your butt is stuck in a couch right now, and you're not serving the Lord in some way, maybe that means if, if you're one of the vulnerable and you really shouldn't be out working uh, or, or serving in different ways, I mean, would you stay home, but you can pray. You can call folks. You can do well checks. You can continue to, to work and serve as the church would, uh, as God has designed the church to be right where you're at. Uh, for some of you, though, we can still, even with social distancing and the other guidelines in place that are for our good, we can continue to serve the community well. That's what's best for the community. And that's what's best for the church. He says, encourage the faint-hearted. Man, encouragement. Is that not one of the best things right now for us to be doing? And could you text some friends? Could you um, uh, contact neighbors? Could you just walk across the street? Could you, if you're still having the ability to work, can you pop in to the cubicle next to you, six feet, and just give some encouragement? And people are hopeless in some cases right now. And and again, there's a spiritual sensitivity out there. What a great reminder. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Help the weak, Paul says. There are 
significant, um, th- there are people with significant vulnerabilities right now. Uh, that's not just from a medical perspective. There are those who uh, have been struggling with depression and loneliness and insecurities, and this quarantine just magnifies that. There are those that physically cannot get out, maybe because they have respiratory issues or something else, uh, or, or maybe just the, their age makes them a little bit more vulnerable. Man, help those who are vulnerable. Paul says, be patient with all of them. Whether they're idle, you admonish them, you encourage them. Whether they're hopeless, you encourage the faint-hearted. If they're weak, you serve them. Look at verse 15. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. This is probably pretty plain for us. We need to make sure that we walk with forgiveness, that we are forgiving to people. You know, um, regardless of how people treat us, we're to always walk with a forgiving spirit, with a forgiving spirit. He goes on in verse 16. He says, rejoice always. Rejoice always. It's essentially that word rejoice can also be uh, the word for praise. Um, as much as you've heard me uh, on the stream today just talk about how I miss singing. And, and there's lots of forms of worship, by the way. Singing is one of those forms. Spending time in the Word of God is, is a form of worship. Praying is a form of worship. Uh, Spending time in fellowship and community is a form of worship. But um, rejoicing and praising uh, is, is unique. And you don't have to do that with a bunch of people. He says do it. There's something that wells up with inside of us when we just praise God. Uh, there's something that, that changes how we view our circumstances when we just rejoice always. Paul knew that. Paul's saying, hey, Thessalonians, regardless of what's going on in your life, and as it even applies 2,000 years later to us, rejoice always. He says, pray without ceasing. Pray always. Again, we talked about this a little bit last week, and and it's just a great reminder. Um, Prayer shapes us. See, what prayer does is it it puts us in a position to really depend on the Holy Spirit. It's not so much... Uh, for us always asking God to do things in our life. I mean, He wants that. He longs for that. But prayer is allowing God to do what He wants to do in our life. Again, it's putting us in a position to depend on the Holy Spirit. And isn't that a remarkable thing to know that the Spirit lives within us? Greater is He who lives in me than He who lives in the world. Amazing. Verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He he, he says, express gratitude and generosity always. Express gratitude and generosity always. Uh, I came across a study um, a few weeks ago that just talked about how our brain is actually wired. God created us to, to experience joy when we express generosity and gratitude. Let me say that again. God wired our brain to experience joy when we express gratitude and generosity. And so I I, I did a little research on that. And and here's what actually happens is that when we express generosity or gratitude, it engages the, the, Tim, I'm going to get these. I'm not a doctor, right? Not a doctor. Uh, uh, Temporal parietal junction, the TPJ is what they call it which recruits the, the reward-related brain areas like, like the orbitofrontal cortex. I looked at a diagram. I saw where that is. I still can't describe it to you, okay? But he, it engages the, the TPJ, which then recruits that related uh, part of the brain to experience and facilitate and release this healthy, happy expression in our brain and in our body. I mean, isn't that fascinating? 
And, and, and Paul wasn't a scientist either, but he just knew that God created us in such a way that when we give thanks, when we express gratitude and generosity, that we experience joy. In fact, he says that this is the will of God. Of course it's the will of God. He created our mind to do that. Love that. He says in verse 20, or verse 19, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but everything, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And I think those, those three verses are, are kind of connected together when he, he begins to talk about not quenching the spirit and ends on uh, abstaining from every form of evil. Listen, anything sinful quenches the spirit. And we're going to talk about that at the very end. He, he kind of lays out the, the rest of that thought and what it looks like to walk in holiness. But, but as we look at just kind of the, 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 the whole of what he's saying here in verses 12 to 22, he, he's saying to the church, hey, function as the church. Operate as the church. You know, walk in these things. Go serve, love, pray. You know, um, earlier in the week, or maybe it was even ne next week, that was an amen if you didn't hear that from one of my dogs. But earlier in the week, we, uh, we st you started seeing this hashtag, Lake Church Loves. And regardless of what you think about that hashtag, I, I think it's great. Um, it's just a reminder to us to be the church, to be these things that First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22 talks about. That we're to be expressing these things. That we're respecting the authorities right now, but we're also continuing to be the church. That we're choosing not to be idle in any way. That, that's why we, we uh, just took six carloads of medical supplies and food over to Cook's Hospital this past week. That's why this week... Uh, we're asking you to participate in something similar as we uh, take significant supplies over to Arlington Memorial. That's why we've partnered with Safe Haven this week as well. Great organization. That's why we're uh, delivering food to AISD children who uh, they have food during the week, but they don't have food during the weekends. And we're doing home deliveries to them. That's why we're encouraging you to... Um, safely walk across the street. If you're shut in right now, or if you, uh, uh, even if you can go uh, to your job, relate to people in this time of hurt, pain, and change. And you can do that by respecting the authorities and still being the church. Lake Church loves, and we need to continue to do that. The spiritual sensitivity right now is so high. Like, this is the time to go to the harvest field. Uh, it's always time to go to the harvest field. But if you want to see some reaping from the Lord, then go to the field. Serve, love, pray, as Scripture teaches us. Last part of this, verse 23 to 28. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Uh, we'll come back to that word. It's, it, it, it's a big word for some of us. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Can't do that right now. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This last portion, you know, in verses 20, or 12 to 22, he's kind of talking about these practical pieces for the church. And now he's giving a very specific piece for us personally. And he's saying, uh, sanctify yourself. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. As the spiritual sensitivity is increasing around us, the isolation is also magnifying secret and hidden sins in our life. What an important thing to hear this morning from Scripture. 
staying blameless, walking in holiness, this is as great of a challenge to do that now as there ever has been. You know, isolation magnifies our problems. It's just a reality that then when we don't have healthy people around us, um, when we don't have healthy community around us, our, our problems just seem magnified. Our past is often reopened. Our sinful desires are amplified. Our insecurities are intensified. And, and even some of the issues that I see being manifested right now, like, um, I mean, Satan is, boy, he is working really hard right now. Um, we're seeing significant upswings in child abuse. We're, we're um, uh, on, a, on a regular basis, more than we normally do, working with uh, men and women who are experiencing uh, hardships with addictions whether that is pornography or substances or, or uh, overeating or, or you, you name it. We're seeing um, depression being magnified. Um, there's there's a, uh, a real sense of hopelessness that so many people are walking in right now. And maybe you. And... You know, this call to walk in holiness, um, this may feel uh, really difficult right now in this time of isolation, in this time of quarantine. Again, all the more important to go back to some of those practical instructions that Paul has for the church. That as you reach out, even if you're sensing these things, feeling these things, that you would also take the initiative to reach out and experience that. But this is a time to, to let go of sin, walk in the freedom of the death and resurrection of Jesus. You know, it's, um, I think there's probably a lot of ways you can catch monkeys, but one of the ways that, you can, uh, that, that they've found that you can catch monkeys um, is by just affixing a jar on a tree and putting a nut in that jar. And uh, essentially what happens is the, the monkey will uh, stick his hand into that jar, grab the nut, but he won't let go of the nut, and therefore he can't get away from the jar. And even when he sees his captors coming toward him, oftentimes that monkey will still. He's so interested in hanging on to the nut that he found in that jar that he will, he, he will not release his hand in order to get away. You know, and for some of us, sin is like that too. That we've given ourselves to, to some form of sin, or maybe we've given ourselves to, to some form of hopelessness, and we just don't want to release our hand from that. Again, here's the beautiful thing about what Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians 5, is that as a result of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can have newness of life when we choose to release that. That He begins to shape us and mold us. In fact, I, I, love, I love what He says in verse 24. Don't miss what He says in verse 24. So often at the end of the book, we get so ready just to uh, finish the book and go, oh, check that off, I read First Thessalonians. But He says in verse 24, He who calls you is faithful, He will surely do it. So there's kind of a dual responsibility here. He calls us to walk blameless, to let go of the nut. But he also says that because he's faithful and what his promise provides, that he will surely do it. That he will surely do it. Here's the call this morning. I know this may seem so different than... Uh, normal when we're all together in a place where where uh, we can talk with somebody or or just experience this. But here's the call this morning: it's twofold. What well, one is that that you would be the church, that you would choose not to be idle, to walk in fear, 
but that you, even during this time, respecting authority, would choose to operate as the church is instructed and called to. You'd recognize that this, this time right now is a great harvest time. Like there's not, there hasn't been a better time in recent years to, to love, serve, share, pray, and encourage people. Would you be the church? I'm asking that the Spirit would just put on your mind some faces, some ways that you can serve, practically to love people around you. The other side of this call is this, to walk in blamelessness, to walk in holiness, as Paul says at the end of this book. That if if you're struggling and, and walking through hardship, you weren't intended to do that in isolation or alone. And, and right now, um, you know, some of these orders I have made it difficult, but we want we want we want to we want to connect with you. We want to spend time with you. So here's here's what I'd encourage you to do. If God's calling you to something, maybe He's also calling you to um, to deal with that addiction. You, we can we can walk with you through this addiction. We can start doing that even in the midst of a quarantine. If there's um, hopelessness that you're feeling or depression that you're experiencing, whether you're a member of Lake Church or not, I mean, we had over 4,000 people connect with us last week. So we know that there's a lot of folks listening, and this invitation is for you too. Regardless of where you're at, if there's something that is constraining you, would you... Would you reach out to the body of Christ? And here's how we want to set that up, given some of the, the boundaries we have right now. Is if you'll email us at respond at lakechurchdfw.org. That's respond at lakechurchdfw.org. If you'll, if you'll email us, just give us your name. Let us know uh, if you'd like us to contact you. Then somebody today or tomorrow will contact you, one of our staff members will contact you, we'll keep it, um, uh, what you share with us on the phone or even in that email will be completely private. That goes just to, actually just comes to me and then we'll, um, um, we'll have different staff reach out to you. But we wanna give you an opportunity to respond this morning. You don't have to sit in your hurt or hopelessness or depression or substance abuse, um, that this is the time to walk blamelessly in holiness with the Lord. Would you reach out, respond at lakechurchdfw.org, and we want to connect with you. Let me pray over you, and then our time this morning uh, will be over. Um, and I know many of you that are uh, part of a connection group are going to be meeting uh, after this and uh, thankful for our connection group leaders that are setting uh, these uh, uh, Zoom or Skype or other uh, calls up. Thank you guys for doing that. That helps facilitate what Paul was talking about right here. But let me pray over you. And if you sense that you need to respond this morning, would you email us at respond at lakechurchdfw.org? Jesus, thank you for your word. Thanks for your faithfulness. Thank you for how you shape your church. Now, Lord, help us walk in that way, faithfully and also blamelessly. That we would walk in holiness personally and as a church during this time. So that those examples that you share with us in scriptures, the church being the light of the world, would be a practical reality for Arlington, Kennedale, Mansfield, Fort Worth, Burleson today. That Lake Church would be that city on a hill. That we would be that light in our neighborhood, in our workplace. Lord, thank you for those that are listening right now and watching. 
Thank you for those extraordinary children, those amazing youth, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Hopefully, we'll see you next week where I'll be on a scissor lift as we're practicing He is risen, He is risen indeed. We'll see you next week one way or the other.